I'm here. <laughs> Just thought I would start this video out, let the blooms speak for themselves. Welcome to a Care Collab video of the Angraecum bossery. I have her labeled as bossery, although it is sesquipedale, variety bossery, which had me a lot confused, not a little, but a lot confused early days when I received her. But let's get to, first of all, the Care Collab. Today, I am teaming up with the Green Pets Thumb, Ed's Orchids, and plants and other things. And I've been around the block several times in order to find some kind of proper lighting to show you that this one has two different colors, even though it looks to be just a white. The sepals are more of an ivory. The petals as well have more of an ivory white to them. And then the lip is almost, almost white. Not quite but almost. And then of course it has these magnificent long spurs. So yeah, my confusion in the beginning when I got this with the tag and Greek Bossery, I got it because of my surname, it's in the name. Bossery is part of my surname. Bossy boots for those that know me well. <laughs> but here we are. I had a little bit of a look-see and kept getting confused when people called it a sesquipedale. I am a little bit of a noob when it comes to knowing about all these names. I just like the orchid, it reminds me of my past. So I bought it and then of course you get a little bit confused and curiosity kicks in and you have to understand why is, are people saying sesquipedale when my label says bossery. Well it is a sesquipedale variety bossery. And there's only one difference really between the two, the sesquipedale being the original classic Garwin's orchid, but the variety bossery is a little bit more compact in comparison to the original sesquipedale. It's a smaller growing version of it. However, the bloom size is exactly the same as the larger, larger sesquipedale, which I am very, very grateful for. Also the bossery in comparison to the sesquipedale, can bloom twice a year and can produce more than two spikes. And that is an added bonus. If I ever get to that, that'd be fantastic. As I film this, I am at the beginning of February, but the orchid in bloom, I am not going to waste the blooms for a care collab. When this video airs towards the end of February, I'm sure I will still have these blooms because they are long lasting, but why risk it? Right now they're super pristine. They've been open in almost five days and they're at their prime in my opinion. And that is why I'm taking advantage of them at this point in time for this care collab. Having the more compactor of the sesquipedales to me is an added bonus because of the space issue. She will grow taller, but eventually also grow out some plantlets at the base. And that will be very, very welcome but she will not get as wide in the leaf span as a sesquipedale. And that is for me a big bonus because for the winter months, I do have to bring her inside. They don't like to have, be cold. They prefer to be nice, warm and toasty all year round. The more humidity you can provide, the better. And that is why I have to bring her in and then space becomes an issue if she were to be much bigger than what she is. So by pure coincidence, I got the smaller version, the bossery, because I wanted it for the name. That was just coincidence. A good one, happy about it. Works for me, works very, very well. And the beauty that the blooms are exactly the same size as the large sesquipedale, that's a real, real bonus, I'll take it. Let's see if she will ever be that big for me to be able to bloom twice a year. I'm not going to go into the, all the Darwin orchid information. I think a lot of people have already heard all about that. I will add a link below from the AOS with regards to the Darwin orchid and the moths and all that stuff. I'm here to show off my beautiful first time blooms and tell you how I take care of her despite the fact that I don't have any humidity that she likes and I don't have the winter temperatures that she likes. My nights outdoors can go as low as five degrees Celsius. This year I've had four for the first time since I've been growing orchids in Southern Spain. 
So she comes indoors into the dining room area that is now my indoor orchid nursery grow space <laughs> while we wait for better temperatures. And I have had normal steady temperatures of 16 degrees Celsius indoors at night, whereas this year was also a little bit of an exception. I got down to 14, which is very unusual. But she managed to pull through. She managed to hold on to the buds because the buds actually develop in late November, just before I had to bring her in. And then it was a touch and go situation to make sure that I don't have any bud blast while she was developing the buds and while I was trying to make sure that there is enough aeration and airflow around this orchid, because that is what they like. They are epiphytic after all, and they prefer to have a lot, a lot of airflow around them. The breeze that you see her bopping in the wind right now is perfect. It's constant and it's warmish. A little bit of dappled sun is fine as well in the winter. In my case in Southern Spain, I have to be uber cautious with regards to how much light I give her. Direct sun is an absolute no-no in my climate. So she lives in full shade during the summer and right, right up against a hedge like you see in the background there now, but in another orientation where I can guarantee her to be in permanent shade and my permanent shade is very, very bright, but at least she's not getting hit with direct sun. This little microclimate with the hedge in the back allows me to water down the hedge and really up the humidity around her. These roots, this root and the one you see branching off down there were grown throughout the summer of 20. And that is quite an achievement for a climate that has next to no humidity 30% is a good day. Even in winter now, it is a sunny day and we are expecting some rain tonight. I still only have 25% humidity in the air. So when it gets warm enough and I am blessed with some rain and it is warm enough for her to be outside, and that is for me a minimum of a night temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, then I will let her get drenched by rain. At, until then, no dice, she stays inside. And especially now that she's in bloom, of course, I'm not gonna put her outside. I really want to enjoy these blooms. I have her in a medium-sized orchid top. Seems to be working really, really well. These roots here are not the ones that are hydrating. I don't miss them during the winter. I'm afraid of probably risking stem rot. So they're just there and you can see the tip has stopped growing, which is a shame. We'll see what happens in the summer if I can recover the root to start growing again and possibly branching. I don't see much branching potential in this one. The other roots that she has are also just very straight and thankfully they went into the pot, no problems whatsoever. These other ones, they are so tough, so stiff, they're actually hard to manipulate even when you think they're wet, there is no give to them. And currently she is being fertilized at 160 parts per million, simply because it is winter and she's growing a little bit slower than normal. She doesn't stop growing throughout the year. She's a 24-7, 365 days a year grower. The only difference is the fact that my climate, because it gets colder, sort of slows down her growth a little bit, so I don't pump her full with my normal 300 parts per million fertilizer, which I do in summer. When the temperatures are warm enough, and because she's always outside, I can be quite radical with how I go at her with the sprayer, and I make sure that her stem and everything gets really, really drenched, and it pours into the pot, and then can drain into this tray, which at this point in time is a little bit low for my liking, so we're gonna top that up. But this time, because this was fertilized water in here, this time I am only putting in plain RO water because I'm trying to control the mineral buildup here, you can see, around the orchid top. And that is simply because she's growing so slowly, at even 160 parts per million, which is half of what I normally give her, yeah, she's not absorbing all of that and it evaporates faster. And then below here, it becomes a bit more concentrated. So if one day it's 160 and then starts to evaporate, the next day that concentration is much, much higher. And that is why I don't go in with 300 parts per million. 
As she absorbs, as the evaporation goes, I just make sure that 160 is a steady, steady amount. But today I'm going to just fill her up with some plain RO water and only in the tray. Very, very mindful of that stem. And then the next time I fill up the saucer there, it'll be at 160 parts per million again. I have her potted in probably about 80% ceramics and then a little bit of lava rock to add some more aeration around the roots. But this one is water thirsty. It drinks a lot. And I have to be very mindful what is evaporation and what is the orchid uh, drinking up. For me, in the case of the orchid top setup, it doesn't really bother me that much because when the saucer is almost empty, I top up. And I just remember, was it fertilizer before? Then it's, I alternate to RO water, but it is a year round process keeping this orchid hydrated. They really, really do like their water. I also put her into the orchid top because they are notorious for not liking their roots disturbed. And in my case, I wouldn't know. When I got her, she was little. She was about half the size here. That was two years ago. And then she sort of sulked, of course, but not long. For one year, I didn't see any growth happening at all. I think she was focusing on the roots getting acclimated into the setup and environment. And there, but there was no signs of stress. So it wasn't like she was having an issue with her environment. But I think it's just the transport shock and whatever that just holds them back until they've got their bearings and then they start to take off. And in the last year and a half, this is the growth that she's given me and it's getting better and better and better. I also love the glaucous effect of the leaves. I very rarely wipe these leaves down because they do have a blue kind of glaucous effect to them. If there were pests on her, of course I'd be more radical, but I'm very, very fortunate that I have not seen any signs of pests since she's been in my care. I do have a resident spider in the pot, and today when I moved her, he wasn't pleased. And for the, or for the presentation, I did kind of destroy some of his web. Uh, he'll be back there, you can see him. He'll be back. I don't want him to go. I love my spiders. They're all forming part of this cute little ecosystem there, and they belong in my pots, and they have a place in my collection. So I try to be very mindful of them. But of course, for the sake of filming, I didn't actually want to have, you know, spider webs predominantly everywhere. <laughs> so I hope he forgives me. When it comes to the blooms, I tell you those spikes took forever to develop. And it has probably something to do with my colder climate and it takes a little bit longer. But now that they're here, they are beautifully fragrant at night. When I'm working at my desk, I can, I can smell her. She has a very, very delicate fragrance. I have the Crestwood in bloom right now as well, and the comparison between the two is astounding. This one is not as in your face that you can determine the fragrance. This one is very, very, should I say elegant, or yeah, you have to, you have to appreciate it when you're up close and recognize that she's a little bit more, has a more discerning fragrance. I don't want to say just jasmine because that is so obvious with the Crestwood. It's more of a there's, a, there's a powdery vanilla to her. That's the best way I can describe it. It's not very, very obvious, but it has like a hint of powder. If you were to open like vanilla powder for, vanilla sugar, for example, for your cookies, like that. Not as sweet, but you can sense the vanilla in there, but it's very powdery. I love it. It's a very elegant fragrance and it's very fitting for her blooms. In the summer when she goes outside, she is going just to be drenched and drenched and drenched. Up against the hedge, 300 parts per million. I do that every morning. I go around and soak everyone at 300 parts per million. And then I repeat the uh, spraying, but with plain RO water at around noon, two o'clock. At least twice a day in my climate, she needs to get a good hose down by the hedge. And then just the RO water is for me to kind of give her a flush so that some of the minerals just flush out and flush off of her and don't become a problem. I don't want any mineral burns going on with the roots. 
Sometimes I have to go with RO water late afternoon, 4, 5 p.m., depending on how dry and if we have a hot wind. So water, water, water. She absolutely loves that. And heat. So the heat, I don't have a problem with in the summer. It's the cold that I have to be very mindful of in the winter. She doesn't like that. And that is how I take care of my and Greycomb sesquipedale variety bossery. I have one question for anybody who watches this video. Please, please, can somebody tell me what these buds here are for? You see that second bud? I cannot get the right question into the Google search to get the answer I'm looking for. I have tried a long time to figure out why are those buds there? Is it because she's still young? And those would have otherwise been similar blooms two per spike? Or are these pollinating blooms that in my case haven't opened yet? Maybe they won't open, maybe they will blast because now I have moved her for the first time in months out of her position and into the outdoors. But I would be very, very interested if somebody could answer me this question. I wish I could tell you about it. Trust me, for years I've been looking, I've been trying to figure it out. Just checking if there's a mealybug. Always mindful. My little spider is now in, not going up there because he's shy, but always mindful for pest invasion. <laughs> but yeah, if somebody could answer me this question. These buds, it is really, really something that I would like to know about. And I would be very, very grateful if you could answer that for me. I want to say thank you so much to Ed's Orchids the green pet's thumb, and two plants and other things. So very appreciated that you are joining me on this care collab. I look forward to watching your videos, the links of which I will add to my description below once I see the videos uploaded. So if you're going in now and they haven't posted their videos yet because also time zones, then you will get a link to their channel. But once I see the videos, I will definitely update those links to pertain to the video of the care collab for this orchid. On a side note, if you happen to have this orchid, my goodness, please, please get in touch with me. My email is in the description below. Of course, if you make videos, I would love it if you were to jump on board for future updates and expand on how many care collab videos we can get worldwide on this beautiful, beautiful species. I hope that this was of help to you if you live in a climate that is super dry. If you, for example, are struggling with humidity, I hope that the setup was of use. And if you have any further questions regarding this orchid and I did not address them, also let me know, please. I appreciate your time. Thank you so very much for watching. Have yourself a wonderful day. Please stay safe. Take care. Bye.